I'm absolutely delighted to um, introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ross Breckenridge. Um, the relationship, I'm sure, is obvious. Um, so Ross is, uh, uh, like Sir Alistair, trained as a clinical pharmacologist. We work together at UCL, and I think he took the really brave step of stepping out of academia and clinical medicine and um, going into the startup world. And he's founded Arjuna Therapeutics, which is a, uh, a startup uh, with a cancer focus. And he's going to talk to us about pancreatic cancer and the Breckenridges. Thank you, Ross. Thank you very much, and uh, congratulations to Richa for being awarded the Sir Alistair Breckenridge Chair of Clinical Pharmacology in Liverpool. So, uh, a round of applause for her, too. Yeah, no, no pressure. <laughs> None felt. Um, the Breckenridge family is extremely grateful for the honour of uh, BPS uh, organising this, uh, this seminar. And uh, thank you very much to Munir and the BPS uh, as well for asking me to, to, to speak at this, which in some ways is slightly weird, but we'll, we'll, we'll get round to that. Um, I'd like to think that at, at this moment in clinical pharmacology Valhalla, uh, Breckenridge and Dollary are arguing about whether it's more uh, prestigious to have your seminar before lunch or after. <laughs> so we've heard a lot about uh, my father's uh, influence on regulation. We'll hear a little bit more from Professor Back about uh, his influence on, on science. Um, but what I'm going to talk about really is some insights that he was able to give as a patient. Uh, and the coincidence is that my company is very much interested in the cancer that ended up uh, killing him. So in the interests of full disclosure of uh, medical records, I'm going to present the case of AB, who's an 82-year-old uh, clinical pharmacologist. Uh, I'm not going to use the word retired. Uh, and he presented at the beginning of 2019 with a really non-specific prodrome um, and uh, went to his GP who found that for the first time he had elevated blood glucose. And this is the point at which he telephoned me and said, I think I've got pancreatic cancer. Unfortunately, he was correct. He had an ultrasound which showed a pancreatic mass and the CT scan showed that unfortunately at that stage it had already spread to his liver and throughout his abdomen. He had a biopsy uh, which confirmed the diagnosis and at the time he had none of the, at the time, actionable uh, genotypic markers. His clinical state at this point was bloody annoyed. <laughs> so he was started on uh, gemcitabine as a single agent and uh, this is sort of typical treatment for somebody of his, uh, his age and, uh, and clinical state. And this uh, comprised three weekly doses uh, and one week off as a cycle. Uh, the three weekly doses really saw him very rapidly stop becoming a cancer patient and start becoming a cancer treatment patient. This is really what cancer patients have to cope with. Uh, most of the things that they feel are due to the treatment rather than the condition. He managed to soldier through five cycles of this and along the way uh, grappled with all the sort of quite typical problems that somebody in this situation had. Uh, he was on a, a stack of uh, medicines. Uh, his, I, I feel for his GP, as you can imagine. Uh, and by the time it came round to November of 2019, it was obvious that things had progressed. He was really unable to tolerate the chemotherapy. And on palpation, he had a craggy liver uh, and was starting uh, to develop oliguria. So the chemotherapy was stopped in the middle of November. And at the, uh, the beginning of uh, December, he died in the place and with the people that he wanted, but probably 20 years earlier than he would have wanted. One of the very few constellations of a situation like this is that one does actually have a chance to have the conversations with, uh, with somebody who you know is going to be gone quite soon. Um, my conversations with, with my dad at this time were really limited to the technical. So really, everything we're about to talk about, or I'm about to talk about now, is really uh, a, a, a precy of, uh, of our conversations. And really, I'm presenting this as a sort of an N equals one study of what patients want. Um, but I think the insights that he had were actually very generalizable. And certainly, as CEO of a, a, a biotech that's trying to develop uh, new cancer drugs, 
um, implanting what patients want and need really early on in the decision-making process is something that, that, that we believe in very thoroughly. To the extent that we've actually appointed a, uh, a chief patient representative a year before we actually get into patients. So patients, this patient definitely wanted to stay alive, but not at any cost. Uh, quality of life issues are really a huge deal. And uh, really, uh, among the, uh, the panoply of treatments that are available, um, really there's no adequate treatment for a lot of the symptoms uh, caused by the tumour and caused by, uh, caused by the treatment itself. The really interesting insight that he had was, uh, and I think this surprised him, that what he really, really wanted to do was to stay out of hospital at any cost. And I think this might be a symptom of the moment when medicine stops being something that you do to other people and starts being something that happens to you, the sort of passivity in there. And in hospital medicine, we very um, regularly will write requests for scans and for, uh, for biopsies without realizing that what we're actually doing is um, committing a patient to half a day or a day of indignity, boredom, annoyance, and fatigue. Um, so everything we do that brings patients back into hospital when they're feeling terrible actually is a, a really big burden. So that's something, that, uh, something that I'll come back to. I'm going to take a step back and talk a little bit about the actual condition as well, because this is really the, the crux of uh, the problems that he had. And for all of his atypical qualities, Sadly, he, his course uh, as a pancreatic cancer patient was entirely typical, entirely average, his survival after diagnosis and, and the clinical course. The problem is that cancer of the pancreas presents late after it's spread, after the therapeutic window is gone. So um, only 20% of patients at best present while they still have a single lesion, at which point they're offered the Faustian pact of a mutilating um, resection like the Whipple's procedure, or nowadays there are, there are uh, more tractable uh, ways of treating single lesions like focused radiotherapy or robotized surgery. As for, as for screening patients, uh, there have been a lot of studies about this. One was published quite recently that did CT scans annually on a group of high-risk patients for pancreatic cancer, uh, and they found that even if you scan people every year with a CT scan, 75% uh, or more of the patients that you, uh, you pick up with new pancreatic cancer, it's already spread, so it spreads very quickly. The really interesting part of this was actually when they went back to look at the scans that they'd taken a year before of the patients where they just discovered disseminated cancer, and they found that they weren't entirely normal, but not abnormal enough to actually action. So I think this is one of the areas where machine learning is going to become increasingly important, and I think... Um, you know, June talking about following the science. I think regulators are going to be following the science into all sorts of areas like machine learning and also liquid biopsy, which is another way that perhaps we can screen populations, although uh, it's being used very successfully to guide treatment of cancers. Uh, it's not obvious yet how it would fit into primary uh, cancer diagnosis or screening, but I think this is an area of great interest. The tumour itself is extremely complicated, and it's a mistake to think of a cancer as just a bag of cancer cells. Um, even within the cancer cell population in a solid tumor, you have a range of different tumor cells that have different roles within the disease and different vulnerabilities to medicines. So that's really very important. The other thing that's become very uh, clear in the last 10 years is the importance of the immune system uh, in, uh, in solid tumors in general. And there is a range of um, immune cells that inhabit solid tumors, ranging from the helpful, the, tu the, the anti-tumor uh, lymphocytes, the unhelpful, the tumor cells that are basically turning off the immune uh, response, and then the, the newer, weirdly, extremely unhelpful groups of uh, cells, such as the Tregs that have recently been found to physically transfer mitochondria into cancer cells thereby making them tumor resistant, which kind of reads like something out of a science fiction movie. The thing that's really important in uh, pancreatic cancer is also the proteinaceous matrix that these cells will sit in. If you actually put a pancreatic cancer um, between your fingers when it's, when it's being resected, it feels like a dried pea 
because it sits in a really hard matrix, which is almost like ceramic. And there's a school of thought that this actually prevents drugs getting to the cells that you want to kill. So really, this tumor has lots of ways of being very, very difficult. The genetics of pancre pancreatic cancer is a little bit more simple in that it's um, thought of as being essentially a disease that's driven by mutations in the KRAS gene. <clears throat> this is one of the uh, oldest recognized um, cancer-causing genes. And uh, mutations uh, in various parts of the protein uh, will drive the cancer process. The interesting thing is that they all have slightly different effects on the intracellular milieu, but they all have the effect of upregulating kinase signaling, a network of kinases in the cell which converges on the mitochondrion. The network is difficult to treat. Simply giving an inhibitor to one or another of the, kinase, uh, the kinases that are active does not work um, because the, the cell can adapt to this. Uh, giving more than one kinase inhibitor to a patient in general is not tolerated by the patient because of the side effect profile. So this has proved uh, a disappointing uh, area of treatment of pancreatic cancer. As for the mitochondrion, the energy-producing part of the cell, the uh, production of uh, the building blocks of new cells and energy is really crucial to driving uh, the, the rapid uh, spread of pancreatic cancer. But this comes at the cost of generating large doses of reactive oxygen species, which actually act as a signaling molecule to drive the process forward, but are also a toxic byproduct that need to be detoxified by the cell. And this is something that, that I'll come back to. So, G12, so the KRAS gene was um, traditionally thought of as being undruggable because of the structure, but actually in a, in a, a really triumphant um, a triumphant announcement a couple of years ago, Amgen and Mirati, two, two large companies, or one large company and one becoming large company, um, announced that they actually had a small molecule that could specifically target the mutant isoform of pancreatic cancer. Not so relevant in, um, in, in pancreatic cancer because G12C is actually relatively rare, but uh, larger in a larger proportion of non-small cell lung cancer patients uh, are affected by the G12C mutated KRAS. The clinical trial was disappointing. It worked, but the effect was only temporary. And when they sequenced the tumors of uh, the patients whose, uh, whose condition had relapsed, and you can see each of these columns is an individual patient, and, and the, uh, the rows are the genes, every patient's different. Every tumor found a different way to escape the treatment. And this really very strongly suggests that single-agent treatment for KRAS-driven cancer is not going to be tractable. And so this is where um, Arjuna's technology comes in. So we're developing a, an entirely novel form of material. This is a platform of small molecules um, that are based on a new form of chemistry, essentially uh, convincing atoms to form entirely synthetic uh, bonds between each other that don't exist in nature. We're looking at uh, small molecules that are made from um, elements in a specific group of the periodic table, and these are defined in terms of their biological properties by the number of atoms that are in them. And the biological properties differ between, uh, between molecules. The physicochemical properties, however, are actually pretty similar. So these are incredibly stable molecules once you've made them. They are not metabolized by anything in the human body. And they passively diffuse across the blood-brain barrier and into cells. They're eliminated passively, so the half-life is prolonged. So actually, they have pretty good drug like properties in terms of giving people once weekly dosages. And our first drug, AG5, is, um, has a, a unique mechanism of action in that it's a catalyst. So on its own, it does nothing, uh, but it catalyzes reactions that are already present that are orders of magnitude more active in uh, cancer cells than non-cancer cells. The reaction that AG5 is catalyzing is, uh, centers on superoxide, which is one of the reactive oxygen species that's generated in huge quantities by uh, KRAS mutant cancer, and actually at very low levels in non-cancerous cells. AG5 catalyzes the oxidation by superoxide of a specific amino acid motif 
in the mitochondrion, because that's where superoxide is generated. This amino acid motif is found in antioxidant proteins, so it has the effect of removing antioxidant proteins only in cells that have lots of reactive oxygen species, and this very rapidly leads to programmed cell death. So if you look at the, uh, look at the panel on the right, uh, every cell essentially you can, you can rank on the, the dose of superoxide that is present in the mitochondrion, and uh, KRAS mutant cancer cells uh, are very much towards this end, and what AG5 does is it has the effect of increasing oxidation and pushing cells into apoptosis. So really what AG5 is doing is not targeting the mutant protein itself, it's targeting a downstream phenotype caused by the mutant protein. And we think there are very good reasons why this is a lot less likely to lead to tumor resistance than targeting uh, higher up in the molecular feeding chain. What we're actually targeting here is the phenotype of balanced high oxidants and high antioxidants, which are present in KRAS mutant cancer cells, but also in metastatic cancer cells. So we've got very encouraging data that once cancer metastasizes, for example, into the brain, whatever its genotype to begin with, it's susceptible to AG5. And also tumor cells that become resistant to treatment do this through elevation of reactive oxygen species. So tumor resistant cells are more likely to be killed by AG5. This is not a new idea, targeting the, the cancer metabolism. But the problem is that every cell generates uh, ATP, and every cell is reliant on, uh, on energy metabolism. So having a drug that simply targets energy metabolism will lead to terrible off-target effects, especially in cells in the heart and the brain, um, or less effect on the tumor because of the low therapeutic index. So you can't actually get to a high enough dose to kill the differentially kill the cancer rather than, uh, rather than your brain cells. So there have been a lot of uh, really big disappointments in this area. Um, Devimistat is something that was made by a company called Raphael um, and failed last month in a very well-designed phase three trial um, after a number of smaller trials that, uh, that showed some activity. What AG5 is doing is actually targeting the detoxification of superoxide, which is rapidly converted into hydrogen peroxide by superoxide dismutase. And hydrogen peroxide, bleach, is obviously incredibly toxic to the inside of a cell. So evolution has given eukaryotic cells two parallel ways of getting rid of hydrogen peroxide and converting it into water, two parallel um, uh, antioxidant systems. These act redundantly, so if you give a pharmacological inhibitor to one or the other, the cell really doesn't mind at all. Uh, and if you inhibit both, then you kill the heart and the brain cells. What AG5 does is it removes members of both families, and it's the only molecule to do this, but only in uh, biologically significant quantities, actually in the cells where uh, these uh, proteins are actually needed. What this... Um, and I, 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 this, again, you know, thinking about what would uh, my dad have liked in a, in a talk like this, he would have wanted to see some data, actually, and he would have wanted to argue about what the data actually means. Um, so here we go. Um, and this is what I think is quite a cool experiment. This is taking a cell, a 3T3 cell, which is not a cancer cell, which is actually quite resistant to AG5. AG5 is not very good at killing cells that aren't high ROS cancer cells, which is a good thing. What we've done here is actually insert a mutant KRAS gene into the cell and turn it on. And what we find is that uh, the, the, up the, the KRAS mutant cells actually have much higher levels of reactive oxygen species, and it sensitizes them to being killed by AG5. So the cancer-causing cancer gene-bearing cells are more sensitive to AG5 than the non-cancer-causing uh, uh, gene-bearing cells. And we can abolish this effect by flooding the cell with DTT, which is a reducing agent. So this is specific. This is due to action, reactive oxygen species dependent activity. And this um, correlates to really quite striking single agent efficacy in uh, animal models. And um, we can kill um, human cancer cells in the context of orthotopic animal, uh, mouse models for lung cancer, which is our first indication, and we're just starting on a collaboration to look at the same, uh, the same project in pancreatic 
uh, cancer. However, we're looking at this in the context of uh, dual therapy with other agents. It's become pretty clear, as I said, that single agent therapy is not going to dent pancreatic cancer or probably most, sing most um, of the, the KRAS mutant solid tumors. And what we find is because AG5 works in such a different way to other, um, other cancer drugs, the phrase ortho orthogonal cancer treatments, it's a, it's a buzz phrase that was coined by Susan Galbraith, who's um, head of oncology R&D at AstraZeneca. Orthogonal means 90 degrees. So basically, if you have two completely different ways of killing cancer cells and combine them, you should have additive efficacy. But the, the, the key here, though, is side effects. If you have additive side effects, then patients aren't going to be able to tolerate this. It turns out that AG5, we believe, has an extremely benign side effect profile because it does not engage the target significantly in non-cancer cells. Although, you know, a dog or a rat really can't give you much feedback on how it's feeling, so we're going to have to wait until the end of next year when the first patients are given AG5. But we've done uh, a fair amount of um, animal toxicology um, to show that AG5 is actually, we believe, going to be very safe. We've had some conversations with, uh, with drug companies, and one of the American drug companies we've spoken to suggested very strongly that we look at the retinal pigment epithelium, because they've had uh, a, a, a compound in this space that had to stop development because it, uh, it, it caused retinal toxicity. Happily, uh, AG5 does not seem to have retinal toxicity, nor does it affect the activated immune system. In ex vivo assays of human immune system, we find, that, uh, we find that AG5 really does nothing to the activated cells, so it's not going to be anti-inflammatory. So these are the helpful immune cells that we don't want to be turning off. So I'm going to finish up by coming back to um, what our index patient really wanted. And the idea of something that actually works that does not add to the side effect burden is, of course, what everybody's looking for in, um, in, in cancer research. And uh, we think that AG5 at least has a chance of fulfilling this. The other thing is that as a, as a CEO of a biotech, basically every decision you make with a very limited amount of money that we have available, everything you make, every decision you make is a capital allocation decision. And everything that you do with money, you can't do with the money for something else. So my conversations really have made me very clear that what we need to do as early as possible is to make an oral formulation, even though it's expensive and inconvenient, so that we can keep people out of hospital when they're being treated. So I'd like to thank my parents, both present and absent. And also, I'm going to mention Michael Tilson, who is my dad's GP. GPs don't often get a shout out in, uh, in, in seminars. And this is somebody who, who really added a huge amount of value and took away a, a lot of the issues uh, that, that were being suffered. Also, the, uh, the growing Arjuna team, uh, a really uh, amazing group of people uh, who have the mission of taking away the fear of a cancer diagnosis, but now also keeping cancer patients out of hospital. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Ross. That was really, really interesting. Um, uh, we have a little bit of time for a couple of questions, if there are any from the audience. Munir. Thanks very much. How does AG5 get across cell membranes? Passively. So you can, you can cool a cell down to four degrees and it gets in uh, in exactly the same way, uh, at the same speed as it does when it's, when it's biologically active. You can poison ATP production and it gets in. So it's entirely passive. Um, if you put a, 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 a solution of AG5 in water in glass, it will actually diffuse into the glass. And it's, it's, the, it's the weird world of something that is so small 
that uh, normal laws of biophysics really don't apply. So it will instantly cross the blood-brain barrier, for example, um, and, 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 it, uh, and then be passively eliminated uh, by the body. Because that's really unusual because there's increasing data that drugs which is thought to be passively absorbed actually are transported rather than absorbed yes, passively. Yes, absolutely. So, so that's very unusual. There's, there's nothing that we can do to a cell that will alter the rate of its ingress. Right. Okay. So, so it is. It is a. It is a new. It is a. We've had to sort of relearn an awful lot of uh, everything because of this, and manufacturing and storage and all sorts of things. Everything is slightly different. Okay. Which is good and bad. <laughs> it's good that you can patent it. It's bad that it takes a long time to figure out what the hell's going on. Great. There's another question, Professor Aronson, at the back. Right at the back. Professor Aronson, who taught me when I was a medical student. <laughs> I, I apologise for that. <laughs> um, I wonder if Alistair ever discussed with you uh, the possibility of going to somewhere like Switzerland and what his attitude to the current controversy about euthanasia was. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think he, he felt that he didn't want to do this. I had this conversation with him, and I think he was looking at me thinking, are you trying to bump me off, <laughs> actually? Um, he, he, for himself, was against it, but the conversations that he and I had when, we were, you know, when I was working in the hospital and you know, we, were, we were sort of having clinician-to-clinician -clinician conversations, I think he, he was very pro the idea of it being available, actually. I mean, a, a lot of us who've looked after patients in hospital have, have felt, I, certainly I personally had the feeling that a lot of things that would make life easier for some people were not available to us. Um, I, you know, I'm treading carefully here because people have very strong beliefs about this. But I know that his belief was that he thought that for people who really wanted it, uh, yes, he was for it. I, I, and I think he felt a bit squeamish when he and I read the data together about what's happened in places like um, the Netherlands, where a lot of people with psychiatric issues um, ended up going down this route. And I think he was squeamish about that, for sure. I don't know if that really answers your question. What do you think about it? There's nothing I would root in this audience about it, but I... Th Thank you. I, I think that where it... If I were faced with this diagnosis, I would make my plans very quickly. Yeah. I think I agree with you, personally. Although, you know, in five years' time, I think once they figured out how to use the anti-KRAS inhibitors in a way that doesn't ruin people's lives, things might be different. Things might be different. And I think we have to, we have to bear that in mind. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Ross. Thank you.